Hello and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School. I'm John Lomacang. Thank you for taking the time to join us. We have been enjoying our study through the book of Genesis, Amen. haven't we? Amen. Uh -huh. And uh, we've had fun together. We've learned a lot together and I pray that that has been your experience too. As we've opened the book of Genesis from the fall, looking at the frailty of humanity and the glory of God through broken, ruined vessels. God can take any bad situation and reverse it to his honor and glory and for the betterment of every one of us. That's been the constant lesson. And we've read some stories that will cause you to blush and others that will cause you to praise God. And today is going to be another revelation. Joseph, Prince of Egypt. How did his life affect the lives of those in Egypt? Well, stay tuned, you'll find out. But right to my left is my good friend, uh, James Rafferty. Good to have you here, James. Good to be here, John. I am going to be covering Monday's lesson, which is Joseph Confronts His Brothers. Ooh, I can't wait for that one. And I know you have a good one. Jason, we haven't seen you all quarter, but good to have you here today. It's great to be here. I'm excited about this. I have Tuesday's lesson entitled Joseph and Benjamin. Mm. Mm -hmm. And Jill, I always look forward to your expositorily uh, outlined approach to the Word of God. I am super excited about this lesson. I think it's one of my favorite the whole quarter. Okay, and Shelly, the lady from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> the lady with the Texas hair. <laughs> I am so excited to be here and I get to talk about how even human foibles, God, God's providence overrules humans' foibles, human foibles. That's a new word, foibles. I have to look foibles. that one up. Say that <laughs> two or three times. <laughs> <laughs> well, good to have you here. Well, Jason, we haven't seen you all quarter, so why don't you have our prayer for us today? Absolutely. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that we have the opportunity and privilege to open your word and study together. And Lord, we just ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit as we study. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 You know, we talked about the unusual providence of God in getting Joseph to the palace <laughs> in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And I talked about it from pits to palaces. God doesn't put you somewhere except there's a providential purpose behind it. Amen. God doesn't just give us a position to, to lavish it or languish in it, but God puts us in places where he knows his name can be glorified but it comes down to the decisions that we make. So we find in Genesis chapter 41, let's all go there together. And what we're gonna see is how God worked in amazing ways through the revelations that he allowed Joseph to communicate. The understanding of each of these revelations came from God, mm -hmm. but the revelations themselves was an opportunity for God to be glorified. The, the text we have first is in Genesis 41 verse 28. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about mm. to do. Mm. I love that, what he is about to yeah. do. So anytime God reveals anything, God is always up to something. I've always stood back and have been amazed at how God has worked through the most unpredictable circumstances, even the most harrowing circumstances, mm. even the most, uh, the circumstances that have caused you to pull over on the side of the road and say, Lord, I, I can't handle this. What's this all about? And I've had those experiences in my own life. Mm -hmm. when, I walked, when I came to church one day and I said, you know, have you ever had the feeling that this is the place you don't want to be? Mm -hmm. I don't want to be here right now. I need you guys to pray for me. And uh, people surrounded me and prayed for me. But I realized that God brings us to certain places that are for a number of reasons. One, refinement mm -hmm. and also remembrance. Mm -hmm. When we forget God, he will find a way to remind us. And the Lord took Joseph through a series of catastrophic events yeah. to bring him to a place of prominence because the Lord loved Pharaoh just as much as he loved Joseph. Mm -hmm. That's amazing yeah. what the Lord did. Let's look at verses mm -hmm. 37 to 57 as the narrative unfolds in the courts of Egypt. Speaking about the advice, this is Genesis 41. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? Mm -hmm. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, "Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, 
There is no one as discerning and wise as you. That's what happens when God is in charge of your life. Yeah. Yeah. You shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. And he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Mm -hmm. And he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried out before him, bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Verse 44. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. And without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. That's powerful. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's some amazing power. He was in a prison not too long before that. Now he's giving commands and Pharaoh says, you say it, they will move. You don't say it, nobody's moving. Look at verse 45. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zephnath Paniah, And he gave him as a wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, Potiphar, priest of On. So Joseph went over all the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now in the seventh, in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. He laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. And Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the mm. sea mm. until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable. Mm. And to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of Ono bore to him. So Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all my toil in my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Then the seven years of plenty, which were in the land of Egypt ended, and the seven years of famine began to come. And Joseph, as Joseph had said, the famine was in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt, there, were, there was bread. So when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. The famine was over all the face of the earth and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. And the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. Mm -hmm. What a story. Mm -hmm. And this has been a pattern throughout the entire lesson. The, the, the writer of the lesson has given us a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. But if you think about going through 13 lessons in 50 plus chapters, yeah. it's not an easy task. Mm -hmm. So it was necessary. And sometimes we skip through it and you miss the examples. So let's go to the question that was written by the constructor of our lesson. What is God's place in the success of Joseph? Mm. Now, what I liked about this, and I want to read exactly the way that the uh, person who wrote the lesson said, it says, Pharaoh selected Joseph to take charge, not so much because he had interpreted his dreams correctly and revealed the forthcoming problem of the land, but because he had a solution to that mm. problem. Mm. You know, God has a solution to every problem. Amen. You may be in a circumstance today that you might wonder, is there a solution? Wait on the Lord and the solution will come. But the one thing that you could do that can reverse, that can make the situation more dire is try to bring about a solution <laughs> when God is not in it. Yeah. God brought a solution from a man who not too long before this was in a pit, but now everyone in Egypt knows who Joseph is. Genesis 30, 41 verse 37 the Bible reminds us about Joseph and the advice that God gives. So the advice was what? Good. Good. In the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. When God gives you wisdom and understanding, nobody could counteract what God has revealed Amen. to you. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God and he will give it without withholding anything. And so also Joseph made it very clear 
that God was in charge of his life. Look at verse 38. This was the clear declaration that Pharaoh saw in the lives of life of Joseph. Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? When you, when you look at the lesson, one of the things you find is that Joseph didn't tell Pharaoh it was imperative for him to accept his God, mm -hmm. but he allowed God to be reflected through his life. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you encounter people that may not want to be what you are doctrinally or spiritually, but that doesn't hinder you from allowing your life to be a place where God is being revealed. Mm -hmm. I've run into people that are secular and very, some political, some very secular, some don't want to hear about God at all. But I've learned this, and, and this is something we could learn. You know, there are people that are very wise in the ways of the world, but I've seen in many instances, I worked for insurance, co insurance companies, banks, law firms, and I've seen whenever the conversation, even when I was a member of the uh, Sky Squires field, uh, 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 an RC airplane uh, club down here in Southern Illinois, I noticed that when difficult times came, the head of the club came to me one day and said, you know, my wife is going through difficulty. Can you pray for me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never told him, I never preached to them on the field, but they saw something that in a moment of difficulty, he came to me and said, Amen. my wife is going through a difficulty. Can you pray for me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right on that Sunday afternoon, right there at the Sky Scars field, we would have it all, all of our model mm -hmm. planes ready to fly. So when you live the life that you should live, God will direct people to you, not for your glory, but always for his. You find also, these are the things that uh, was evidence that God was in the life of Joseph. And what happens, what evidences should be revealed in the life of those who are led by the hand of God? Psalms 19, verse 7, notice what happens when we follow God's leading. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The simple. Joseph, at one point in his life, had a lot of learning to do. I love the way you pointed that out. He couldn't keep his mouth shut for his own glory, but now he's opening his mouth for the glory of God. He became wise. He used to be simple. Psalm 119 and verse 130, the entrance of your word gives light. It, give, it gives understanding to the simple. And when that understanding is revealed, all you've got to do is stand back and let God be seen. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work and glorify your Father which is in heaven, Matthew 5 and verse 16. Not only that, jo jo Joseph recognized that it was not his actions, but God's. Philippians 2.13, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God can do for us also what he did for Joseph. And what was that? Here's the quick reminder. Psalm, um, Genesis 41 verse 33, now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and a wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. God can give you discernment and wisdom and then put you in a position where he is glorified. Amen. Amen. James? Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. My name is James Rafferty, and I have Monday's lesson, Joseph Confronts His Brothers. It's based on Genesis chapter 42. And like you said, John, the author of the quarterly wants us to read a lot. Read Genesis 42. Well, we're not going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to summarize it because there's a lot here that the quarterly has brought out that I think is really good. So famine, the famine in the land really obliges Jacob to send his sons to Egypt. That's where we left off. There was a famine in the land. It wasn't just in Egypt, but it was in the whole land. And sometimes God works through the famines in our land to bring us to the place where we can be helped That's or we can be delivered or we can be saved and this is what's happening with Joseph now remember Jacob hasn't seen his son forever right mm -hmm. he believes he's dead he's lost mm -hmm. and God is going to work through this famine as he works through the famines in our lives mm -hmm. to bring uh, a blessing to Joseph mm -hmm. to bring renewal to him to reunite him with his lost son. Mm -hmm. And I think God is going to work through the famines in our lives to reunite us Amen. with our lost destiny, with our yeah. lost image, with the kingdom that God established on this earth that we would enjoy for, for all eternity. So ironically it is Jacob who initiates this project. Now God, I believe God is working on his heart because of course God has a purpose for him. And sometimes God speaks to us. He works on our hearts and we don't know why it is that we make some of the actions that we do, but afterwards we see that God is working through the whole thing, mm -hmm. through the whole That's process. Right. Mm -hmm. 
So the unfortunate old man is a victim of circumstances beyond his control, mm -hmm. thinking they're bad, but they're actually good. Unknowingly, he sets in motion an amazing chain of events that will lead him to being reunited with the son whom he has mourned for so long. Mm -hmm. Praise God. So the providential nature of this meeting is highlighted through two fundamental characters. First of all, it is seen as a fulfillment of Joseph dream, Joseph's dreams. Mm -hmm. Remember the event was predicted in Joseph's dreams that your sheaves will bow down to my sheaf, right? Mm -hmm. That's Genesis 37 verse 7. This is now taking place. Joseph is identified as the governor over all the land, all right? That's uh, uh, Genesis 42, 6. And the Lord of the land, Genesis 42, 30 and 33. So Joseph's powerful position position is in contrast with the need of his brothers who bow before him with their faces to the earth, Genesis 42, 6, when they go there to the, to the governor of the land to try to get uh, victuals, to try to get food um, to keep their families and their flocks alive. And then it goes on to say the same 10 brothers who mocked Joseph about his dreams and doubted their fulfillment. It says 10 because there's 12 altogether. Joseph was number 11. Benjamin, who hadn't been born yet, was number 12. So second, this providential meeting is described as a response. The linguistic and thematic echoes between the two events underline the, characteristic, the character of just retribution. Now, here we go. The phrase they said to one another in Genesis 42, 21 was also used when they began to plot against Joseph in Genesis 37, verse 19. So they said to one another, here comes that dreamer of dreams. They said to one another, okay, the governor, he, and, and, and the story goes on. They also used this, the brothers also, when they were sojourning, when they were sojourning in prison, excuse me, it echoes the sojourn of, of Joseph when he was in prison in Genesis 43 and 4. In fact, Joseph's brothers relate what is, what is currently happening to them and what they did to their brother perhaps 20 years ago when they say, then said they one to another, we truly are guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when, we, when he pleaded with us and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Now, I kind of want to pause here for just a second. I, I, this is really significant mm -hmm. because sometimes when we turn away from good and we do evil, we close our ears and our eyes mm -hmm. to God's convicting spirit. Mm -hmm. Obviously, these brothers had not done that yet. And so they're coming to a place where they're remembering their evil mm -hmm. and they're regretting it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're coming to a place and they're really, they're open to it. They're susceptible to, to think about what they did in the past mm -hmm. and to make a turn for the better. Mm -hmm. So we need to recognize sometimes when God reminds us of our past, you know, and sometimes that happens, you know, we get a guilt complex or Satan comes in there or whatever. Sometimes that's to bring us to a place where we stand before God guilty so that Romans 3.19, our mouths can be stopped. We can become guilty before God and then we can be turned to Jesus Christ. We can Amen. be turned Amen. to his forgiveness. That's good. And that's what these brothers needed right now. And this is what they're going to accept, they're going to experience. So it goes on here and it says, Reuben's words, his blood is now required of us, Genesis 42, verse 22, is the echo of the past warning, shed no blood, Genesis 37, verse 22. So they reinforced the link between what they were now facing and what they had done. You know, every one of us is going to face, come, come to face to face with the record of our lives. And, and God is calling us to come face to face with that record right now while there's a mediator in heaven Amen. and while we can have forgiveness for our sins. Mm -hmm. That's what God designed. Some men's sins are open beforehand going to judgment and others they follow after. And those that follow after can't be hid. God wants to hide our iniquities. He wants to hide the history of our sins. The whole thing is going to be blotted out. God wants to do that for every single human being That's right. on planet earth. That's really what the investigative judgment is all about. It's not a negative thing. It's, at, it's, it's part of the everlasting gospel. Mm -hmm. So it must be a good thing. It must be good news. Amen. So most of us surely have done, the lesson quarterly says, things for which we are sorry. So how can we, to whatever degree possible, make up for what we've done? Also, why is accepting God's promise of forgiveness through Jesus so crucial for us? Why is it so important for us and how can we, how can we make amends? Well, one of the ways I think that's really important for us to recognize and make amends is as Joseph's brothers did, to think about our past when the Spirit convicts us mm -hmm. and to allow God to give us that remorse or that regret. 
Mm. Don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid. Mm. If you've made a mistake, don't be afraid to acknowledge it. This was the, was the experience of, of the famous leaders of the Old Testament, like David, for example, who Jill, you brought out in our last session, acknowledged his sins and iniquities in Psalm 51, right? Against thee and thee only have I sinned, because really, ultimately, all sin was paid for by God. That's right. God wants us to experience forgiveness. Now, what's really interesting, I'm just going to jump back here to Genesis 41. John, you covered that chapter, but just one verse mm -hmm. that I think is really significant. Verse 51, it says that Joseph named his son Manasseh because God has caused me to forget all of my father's house and all of my trouble. Now that word Manasseh, it's a really significant word. It means in the root to forgive, to remit or to remove. God has caused me to forget. In other words, Joseph had come to the place where God had caused him to forget and in a sense forgive what his brothers had done to him. That's because right. Joseph had realized God's brought all this evil for good. Hmm. Yes. God praise the Lord. And so God does that in our lives. God works in our lives so that He can actually heal us. Mm -hmm. He can bring forgiveness to us, even if other people who have hurt us are not in the picture yet. Mm -hmm. right. Sometimes that forgiveness comes mm -hmm. first to us before the other people are even in the picture. Joseph's yeah. brothers aren't in the picture yet. You're right. He hasn't even seen them, but he's already feeling the grace of God, the forgiveness of God. Mm -hmm. God, and says, I'm going to name my first son, I'm going to name him Manasseh. And by the way, Dan is not present in Revelation chapter 7, the sealing chapter. You know, you have the 12 tribes there symbolized. Mm -hmm. Dan is gone because Dan is an adder in a way. Uh, we'll talk about that later, but, but he's replaced. There's still 12 tribes there and the one who places him is Manasseh, the okay. one who forgives or the one who causes to forgive. Now, but I think this is significant. Even though Joseph forgives his brothers, he still tests them when they show up. Mm -hmm. Just because we forgive people doesn't mean we just bring them right into the circle again and we just trust them, right? We can forgive people and still have a little bit of a, uh, a boundary there, right? Mm -hmm. We can have a little bit of a boundary there and say, wait a minute, I want to see if these guys have changed. I mean, when we look at the stories of the Old Testament, we see this over and over again. For example, Job, he prayed for his friends, his miserable, comforter, worthless physician friends. He prayed for his friends, <laughs> right? But he still challenged them when they said, yeah, Joseph, you're, I mean, J Job, you're, you know, your theology's off. No, it isn't. Uh, you don't believe, I do believe in God. He still stood up to them, right? Mm -hmm. So our attitude toward others or forgiveness or prayer of intercession doesn't mean that we just acquiesce to what they believe, what they, we don't have to be what others say we are. We are what God calls That's us right. to be. Mm -hmm. And we see this in David too. You know, David had this attitude of forgiveness towards Saul, but he didn't head back to the palace, you know. He maintained his distance. He had healthy boundaries. And Joseph has set up these healthy boundaries. I want to see if these brothers have changed, if they're different. And I'm going to put a little test in, in place here. And so when Joseph's brothers come, we see the whole, and this is the whole scenario of, uh, of Genesis chapter 42. He tests them. He decides, you know, I'm going to put the cup in there and I'm going to put the silver back and I'm going to see how they treat Benjamin. I'm going to see if Benjamin will come. I'm going to put one of them in prison. I'm going to test these guys. And you know, they, they bear that test. They accept their situation. And eventually, as jo Joseph reveals himself, they confess, indeed, that they had sinned. They confess it not just to Joseph, but also to Jacob. Mm -hmm. right. And reconciliation takes place. You know, forgiveness brings reconciliation mm -hmm. to all of yeah. our relationships. Mm -hmm. And that's what God is all about. So thank you, that's wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, also what we, I've been mentioning the writer of the lesson. I want to just acknowledge Jacques uh, B. Dukan, mm -hmm. who has done an excellent job in constructing this lesson with an entire wonderful committee. But uh, we have more for you to enjoy. Don't go away, we'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our 3 ABN Sabbath School panel on the book of Genesis. And now we're going to go to Jason Bradley. 
All right, I've got Tuesday's lesson, and it is entitled Joseph and Benjamin. And you know, Joseph's journey is perhaps one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Uh, there are so many lessons that can be gleaned from his experience, but I'd like for us to start by looking at his father, Jacob. Mm. Uh, there's somewhat of a natural order to life, and what I mean by that is uh, that Parents aren't supposed to outlive their children. Mm. Uh, it's unfortunate that death is currently a part of life, and I can't think of anyone that I know that hasn't experienced the loss of a loved one. I know for me, I've lost consistently uh, about two, uh, two loved ones, two family members per year mm. for five or six years in a row. Mm. Mm. Death is painful yeah. and traumas from tragedies can make us slower to move and sometimes leads us to a state of analysis paralysis. Mm. I want us to look at several verses and you'll notice a common thread here. Uh, the first verse I want us to look at is Genesis chapter 37 verse 35. And you may want to write these down because we're we're going to move through these rather quickly. Uh, but Genesis chapter 37, verse 35 says, And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused mm. to be comforted. And he said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Genesis chapter 42, verse 38. But he said, My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If any calamity should befall him along the way in which you go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. Uh, perhaps by now you're noticing the common thread, but we'll look at Genesis chapter 42, verse 4. It says, But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, Lest some calamity befall him. It is only when we are placed in des a desperate situation that we take desperate action. And as the lesson points out, Jacob could not easily allow the departure of Benjamin, his only son with Rachel, who remained with him. He was afraid that he would lose him as he already lost Joseph. It is only when there was no more food and when Judah pledged to guarantee the return of Benjamin that Jacob finally consented for a second visit to Egypt mm -hmm. and allowed Benjamin to go with his brothers. And I can only imagine that Jacob's level of anxiety must have been at an all-time mm -hmm. high. Uh, Genesis chapter 43, verses 13 and 14. Take your brother also and arise. Go back to the man. And may God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may release your other brother and Benjamin. Mm. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. Mm. And I can picture him saying that with, with such pain and, and yeah. passion in his voice. It's interesting, uh, according to Dr. Kevin Fleming, persistent complex bereavement disorder is a DSM-5 diagnosis assigned to individuals who experience an unusually disabling or prolonged response to bereavement. Mm. Some of the symptoms of PCBD uh, <laughs> that stood out to me as it could possibly have pertained to Jacob's situation were feeling shocked, stunned, or numb since a loved one's death, feelings of disbelief or inability to accept the loss, mm -hmm. rumination about the circumstances or consequences of the death, mm -hmm. trouble trusting others, intense reactions to memories or reminders of the deceased. Wow. Mm. The thing that continues to blow my mind is that Jacob's grief or his bereavement uh, fell under false pretenses. In other words, Joseph wasn't dead. Mm. And the actions of his brothers caused their father an immense amount of pain for an extended period of time yeah. and impacted his decision-making process. Mm. Now, I don't want to sound too cliche, but it's important that we're cognizant that of the choices that we make, realizing that they don't just impact us. Mm. That's right. They have long-lasting ramifications mm. for others as well. The lesson poses the question, what effect had Benjamin's presence on the course of events? I'd like to submit to you that Benjamin was the spiritual barometer by which Joseph measured the fruit of his brother's lives. Mm -hmm. Allow me to unpack that. Matthew chapter 7 verses 18 through 20 says, 
A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, hmm. nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And verse 20, therefore by their fruits you will know them. Mm -hmm. Joseph tested his brothers on multiple occasions, as you <laughs> brought out uh, earlier, Pastor Rafferty. And I love this quote that's found in Patriarchs and Prophets and saw on pages 228 and 229. It says, Joseph sent messes unto them from before him. But Benjamin's was five times as much as <laughs> any of his brothers. By this token of favor to Benjamin, Joseph hoped to ascertain if the youngest brother was regarded with the envy and hatred that had been manifested toward himself. Mm -hmm. Still supposing that Joseph did not understand their language, the brothers freely conversed with one another. Thus, he had a good opportunity to learn their real feelings. Mm -hmm. Still... He desired to test them further, and before their departure, he ordered that his own drinking cup of silver should be concealed in the sack of the youngest. Mm. There are a couple of key takeaways. Number one, Joseph valued family and sibling unity. Mm -hmm. Number two, the ministry of reconciliation is our responsibility. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 20 mm. says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Mm. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, normally we stop right there. We say, Amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. But we're going to continue to verses right. 18 through 20 mm -hmm. because you have to catch this. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through That's Jesus right. Christ mm -hmm. and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Yeah. That's right. yeah. Point number three. Sometimes it's in our darkest moments that God's light shines the brightest. Mm -hmm. Joseph possessed qualities that were needed in trials. And so let's take a look at those qualities. James chapter 1 verses 19 and 20. Mm. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, mm. slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Mm. Point number four, sometimes separation is preparation for our eternal destiny. God took the tragedy that occurred in Joseph's life and turned it into a triumphant saving grace. Amen. That's right. And finally, point number five, we all experience trials and that's a fact. Mm. <laughs> How can we profit from trials? James chapter one, verses two through five. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Mm. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally mm. and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So the question I leave you with is, who do we reflect as we're going through our trials? Amen. Great job, Jason. I love that. Amen. Um, each one of you, thank you for the lesson. I am Jill Morricone, and I have Wednesday's lesson, the Divination Cup, but I actually took the liberty to rename this lesson. My name for it is True Repentance Revealed mm. because that's what we see in Genesis chapter 44. As we've seen already and through this journey, Joseph was sold as a slave when he was 17. He spent 10 years in Potiphar's house, three years in prison. He's 30 when he became governor of Egypt mm. over all the land. There were seven years of plenty and the famine began. Be so it's been a while mm -hmm. since he has seen his father. We're talking years. Now it's interesting. 
Why did it take Joseph so long to reveal who he was to his brothers? When Pastor James had his lesson in Genesis chapter 42, Joseph could have said, hey guys, I'm Joseph, <laughs> but he did not. Mm -hmm. And there has to be probably at least a year or more than a year from Genesis 42 till we get down to Jason and my lesson because they were there in Egypt. They went all the way back to Canaan. They ate and ate and ate and used up all the food. And then finally, Daddy Jacob gives permission for Benjamin to go with the brothers back to Egypt. So this is quite a while. And then Joseph still has the meal and gives more portions to Benjamin. And still he does not immediately reveal who he is. You see in Genesis 42, as Pastor James brought out so well, there was conviction and there was regret. The Holy Spirit was working, bringing conviction. What did they do to Joseph? Mm -hmm. There was regret, but I don't think you see true repentance till you get to Genesis chapter 44. I divided it into three sections. We have the setup, the brother's response, and then Judah's intercession, which is my favorite part. So let's look at the setup. We are in Genesis 44 verses one through five. And he, this is Joseph, commanded the steward of his house saying, fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack. Also put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest and his grain money. So he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning dawned, the men were sent away, they and their donkeys. I'm sure they were happy they'd had this feast. Benjamin gets to go back. Simeon's released. Everything's going well. When they had gone out of the city and were not yet far off, Joseph said to his steward, get up, follow the men. And when you overtake them, say to them, why have you repaid evil for good? Hmm. Is not this the one from whom which my Lord drinks and with which he indeed practices divination? You have done evil in so doing. So they were set up, the brothers were, to make it look like they had stolen. They had stolen the money and they had also stolen the divination cup. Hmm. Siphomancy, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Siphomancy is divination using a cup mm. or a goblet. Mm. It may involve forecasting by using a cup of water and reading the signs represented by certain articles that are floating in the water. It's considered one of the oldest methods of foretelling the future by means of crystalline reflection, both in ancient Egypt and in Persia. So divination with liquids was common, but it was strictly forbidden. We know that in Leviticus, you shall not eat anything with blood, nor shall you practice divination or soothsaying. So why does Joseph even make it appear as if he's using the divination cup? Because that's clearly not biblical. I would say there's three reasons. First, the divination was a means of acquiring information. Joseph used the cup to acquire information, not by pouring liquid into it in some sort of seance with trying to foretell the future. He did it by testing his brothers. That's how he used it to acquire information. Had they really changed? Were they repentant? Uh, the second reason I see is that taking of the divination cup increased the guilt of the offender. It would have held great financial and spiritual significance in the land of Egypt. So if one of the brothers was found to have the divination cup, it would be a huge deal for them there in Egypt. And the third reason is the divination cup would indicate to the brothers that Joseph could read their hearts. Mm -hmm. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 229. Joseph had never claimed the power of divination, but he was willing to have them believe that he could read the secrets of their lives. Once again, it's putting pressure on them. Now let's look at the brother's response. The first response is that of innocence. Who, us? We didn't take the money. We didn't do anything. Why would we take the cup? Their second response is one of smugness, one of cockiness. We are so certain that we didn't take the cup, that whoever's bag has the cup, you can kill him. Mm. That's smug, right? We're certain that we didn't take the cup. And the steward kind of modifies the sentence, says, no, they're not going to be killed, but they'll just be the slave. Hmm. They will become a slave. Now we see the true repentance being revealed because the brothers could have said what? Okay, it's in Benjamin's cup. Good riddance. He's going back to Egypt. We're going home to daddy. We're not concerned about it like they had done with Joseph, right? Hmm. 
He's gone. We don't care. We're going back to dad. We don't care if we break our father's heart. We don't care if we hurt him. We don't care what our sin has cost. But instead, they all tore their clothes. Instead, they all returned to Egypt with Benjamin. Takeaway number one, true repentance acknowledges my own sin and doesn't point fingers at others. All the brothers responded with grief. All the brothers took the blame. And then we see Judah speaks in Genesis 44, verse 16. Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? How shall we clear ourselves? Mm. God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Here we are, my Lord's slaves, both we and he also with whom the cup was found. Mm. Judah recognizes that they're guilty before God. Not that they took the cup. They're not guilty of that. But their sins of the past have come back to, you could say, haunt them. They right. recognize the guilt that they incurred with being jealous of their brother, with hating their brother, with selling their brother. Takeaway number two, true repentance acknowledges guilt before God alone. Our sin is to God and God alone. And they acknowledge and recognize the sin in their life. Joseph answers and he says, you're all not going to be slaves. I'm only keeping Benjamin. Hmm. Now we come to my favorite part. This is Judah's intercession. It's the longest speech that you find in the book of Genesis. Right here is Judah's intercession. I think there's three elements in Judah's appeal. There's an attitude, namely submission to Joseph's authority. There's an action, namely repentance. This is a change in Judah's behavior in which he's willing to offer himself as a slave so that Benjamin can go free. And there's an affection or an emotion seen in the heartfelt appeal that Judah makes to Joseph's compassion, where he gives Ju the devastating consequences. This is what's going to happen to our dad. If you keep Benjamin, this is what's going to happen to our dad. Judah offers himself in the place of Benjamin. He says, let Benjamin go free to our father and I will stay. I will be the one imprisoned. Mm -hmm. I will be the slave. Mm -hmm. We studied several lessons ago, Mount Moriah, substitutionary atonement. Remember when Abraham was ready to offer his son Isaac, the ram was caught in the thicket and the ram was offered in place of Isaac. We see substitutionary atonement here. Judah, what does he say? Take me. I will be the substitute. I will take the penalty. I will take that on myself. I will stand in Benjamin's place so that he can go free. Mm -hmm. Judah, the one who suggested to sell Joseph as a slave, he's now offering his own life in exchange for his younger brother. Why? Because he loves his father mm -hmm. and he doesn't want to cause him pain. Mm -hmm. Takeaway number three, true repentance grieves the sin that hurts our father's heart. Takeaway number four, true repentance doesn't want to commit another sin to further grieve our father's heart. Judah regretted, he was sorry for, he repented what he had done in selling Joseph as a slave and he didn't want to hurt his father more by keeping Benjamin from his father. You know, I used to wonder why Judah, why Jesus came from the lineage of Judah. Why is that? Because he sold his brother as a slave. But we see the greedy man who sold his brother is now willing to become a slave himself so that he can go free. I used to wonder why is Judah the father of Jesus? Because he w had that whole affair with Tamar, his daughter-in-law. And yet the man who lived a sensual pleasure oriented life now offers to deny himself any pleasure, any rights, any personal freedom in exchange for his brother's freedom. Mm -hmm. The man who closed his heart against his father's grief for 21 years now says he cannot bear to see his father grieve the loss of his brother, Benjamin. And so he offers himself as a substitute in Benjamin's place so that Benjamin can go back home to his father. That is true repentance revealed. Amen. <laughs> and praise the Lord and thank you all for this is such an amazing study. I'm Shelley Quinn. I have Thursdays and it is I am Joseph, your brother. You know, in Genesis 45, the providence of God is made manifest in a very powerful way. So Joseph, 
looks very Egyptian. He's dressed Egyptian, no facial hair, I'm sure, probably had a shaved head. His brothers don't recognize him. He's speaking in Egyptian. And as you said, he was 17 when he was sold into slavery, 30 when he was brought before Pharaoh, seven years of good. So now we're at 37. And this is probably a couple of years into it. So it's 21 or 22 years since he was sold into slavery. They don't recognize him, but he's listening in. They don't know he can speak Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Listen to Genesis 45, one. Joseph is overwhelmed by his brother's words and he mm -hmm. could not restrain himself before all those who stood before him. And he cries out, make everyone go out for me. He mm -hmm. sends out the Egyptian attendants because he wants to maintain his dignity. Mm -hmm. So no one stood mm -hmm. with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Mm -hmm. the, the quarterly brings out, made himself known. That expression is used of God in a number of instances. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, God is making himself known. Mm -hmm. He's revealing his providence during this episode. So verse two, Genesis 45, verse two. Joseph wept aloud and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. He's releasing 22 years of pent up emotion. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed <laughs> in his presence. <laughs> They're stunned. Here all of a sudden, I'm sure he, he's now speaking to them in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Joseph turns to them and he here's this Egyptian governor who's saying to them, I am Joseph, your brother. Mm -hmm. And they're like, uh-oh. I mean, they're not sure. Joseph said in verse four to his brothers, please come near to me. That would be breaking protocol. And they came near. And then he says, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Mm -hmm. Now, what I love is the next three verses because there is this profound confession of faith because what we're going to see is three times Joseph acknowledges it was God mm -hmm. who sent him to Egypt. Genesis 45, 5. But now he's speaking to his brothers. Do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me. That's the yeah. first time. Mm -hmm. God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land. And there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. Verse seven. And God sent me. Second mm -hmm. time he's acknowledged this before you to preserve a posterity. You know what that word literally means? A remnant. He says, right. God sent me to preserve a remnant mm -hmm. for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Mm -hmm. Now look at verse eight. He said it twice. Listen to what he says again. Mm -hmm. So now it was not you who sent yeah. me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all of his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Mm -hmm. You know what? It's interesting. Joseph was this spiritually immature young man, mm -hmm. a little bit full of himself. He gets sold into slavery. And I guarantee you on that long walk to Egypt, that's when God began to mature him because mm -hmm. we see his mm -hmm. spiritual maturity when he was in Potiphar's house in prison and now in front of Pharaoh, but he recognizes it was God's hand that providentially set him where he was and God worked beyond their bad intentions. Mm -hmm. The brothers didn't have good intentions, mm -hmm. but it was actually God who sent him to Egypt to preserve life through Joseph's leadership. And as I said, we see that when, when he uses this word posterity, it means remnant, Joseph understood the Abrahamic covenant. Mm -hmm. Jacob 
understood. He had explained it to Joseph. Joseph understands that this covenant promises a nation, referring to the people of Israel, who are then to spread God's covenant blessings to all future generations and nations. So verse 9, Genesis 45, 9, here's what he says. Hurry up and go to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen. You shall be near to me, you and your children and your children's children, your flocks and your herds and all you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to parity come to poverty, for there's still five years of famine. Mm. See, God didn't just give Joseph a plan to save Egypt. Mm. He gave him a plan to save the clan of Jacob mm -hmm. by moving them to Goshen. And you know mm. what? Goshen was the most fertile area in Egypt. This is where their herds can be roaming and actually grazing in richness. Mm. And over 400 years later, mm. at the time of the Exodus, where do we find the, the, the clan of Jacob? Goshen. Mm. In Goshen. Oh, yeah. So they lived there for four, over 400 years. Mm. Now, what Joseph does is he arranges for all these animals in the caravan of the brother to be loaded up with food to take to Jacob and their relatives. But then this is interesting. The text kind of makes it sound like it's Pharaoh's idea, but at least we know Pharaoh approved of it. They send carts down and these carts are going to play. Uh, these are, were to transfer the weaker members of the plan when they are immigrating back to Egypt. Mm. And they play an important role in the story. Let's look, Genesis 45, verse 25. Then they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob, their father. And they told him saying, Joseph is still alive and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. Wow. And Jacob's heart stood Still, mm -hmm. <laughs> I want to say something here. This abbreviated account, and remember, we've talked about how distilled the accounts in Genesis are, how mm. condensed they are. This abbreviated account of this in incidence doesn't record Jacob's sons confessing to their father mm. their sin, but obviously they had to confess. I, I would assume mm. at this point they're confessing. Can you imagine, this is one thing that's hard for me to imagine. These brothers, 10 brothers, had kept a secret yeah. mm -hmm. for 22 years. Mm -hmm. They had watched their father mm -hmm. mourn mm -hmm. for 22 years. Mm -hmm. They knew their sin caused him pain. But as you said, Jill, they didn't come to true repentance right. until it nearly happened again mm -hmm. with Rachel's other son, Benjamin, is when they finally, there's a selfishness that's revealed yeah. here. But he's stunned because he does not believe them. But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to him, when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, mm. that, that was key. The spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. And then Israel, that's, that's the spiritual name that God gave to Jacob. Israel is a spiritual name. Mm -hmm. So now Israel says, it is enough. Joseph, my son is still alive. I will go see him before I die. God's blessings are on Jacob. He's going to be reunited with his son. He is going to enjoy prosperity. And I've got one final point that I am going to leave for our concluding thoughts, but it's a beautiful story. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Okay, I thought you were going to give it right now. <laughs> no, I was that. waiting for it. <laughs> okay. Well, James, summarize your day or well, your final thoughts. Forgiveness is a two-way street. Yeah. But first, forgiveness comes from God and it comes to us unconditionally, just like it did with Joseph. Joseph forgave his brothers, but when his brothers came to the place where they were about to experience that forgiveness in ways they didn't understand, and many times we experience forgiveness from God in ways we didn't understand, mm -hmm. it tested them. Forgiveness is a two-way street because it elicits our response, and that response is vital in the plan of salvation. Amen. Amen. Jason. Just as Joseph was sitting there listening to his brothers as they were speaking in their language, people are watching how you respond to trials. And uh, if you respond in a way that brings Christ the honor and the glory in the most difficult of times, someone's soul could be one to him as a result of that. Amen. Amen. That's good. Uh, Genesis 44 is all about repentance and specifically Judah's repentance, although it was all of the brothers. I don't know, in your life, you might feel that you have walked a Judah path. Maybe you've acted out of jealousy. Maybe you've killed someone. Maybe you've acted out of hatred and envy and lust and passion. Know that the Lord Jesus can forgive. Amen. That he can restore. That um, you can have the privilege of walking with Jesus and becoming a leader for him. Amen. My thought as I read through Genesis 45, this is a story of reconciliation. And Joseph is an inspiring example to us of how we should forgive, not hold grudges, and be reconciled to one another. And sometimes, you know, when people do bad things to us, later Joseph is going to tell them what you intended for evil, mm. God intended for good. But when people do bad things to us, we need to remember, hey, God is in control. Mm -hmm. How is God going to turn this around? Mm -hmm. That's what Joseph did, and he's an inspiration to me. Wow, Amen. wow, what a story. I mean, this book has been rich. Mm -hmm. uh, Genesis, you wouldn't think that the Bible could begin like a blockbuster <laughs> movie, mm -hmm. and we have really been able to uh, break this story down to small tidbits to be able to digest it, and it has shown us the clarity and the beauty of God. And that's why I love the words of John 14, 29. Mm. And now I have told you before it comes mm -hmm. yes. that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I believe. Mm -hmm. We believe because God has been so wonderful to us. We're going to encourage you to come back and join us for a lesson number 13, which is entitled Israel in Egypt. What can we, le what can we learn from that? But here's a thought about Joseph's life. It's Proverbs 15, 33. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. If you want to experience the honor of God, choose to be humble. See you next time.